Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Thank you to those who are rejoining us from the session from Tuesday. We're going to get through the whole thing today. We're really working on it. Um, today's session is the first of three. Benjamin mentioned this is the first of three sessions, and today's session we're going to be introducing this idea of a progression strategy for your students who are getting involved in AAC or you've been working with them and it, you might be using single message devices such as the Big Mac and you want to be moving them on towards multiple message devices and on to apps such as Sounding Board. So we're going to be talking about those strategies, assessment um, op options as well as implementation in the classroom options. Um, session two, we're going to be continuing with those implementation strategies and talking about how you collect data um, right there in the classroom and on those strategies. And then session three is on analyzing that data. And so they'll just be um, a progression of those sessions. So that I get to know a little bit about who you are. And while you're uh, filling out this survey that's on the screen, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my background. I got involved in augmentative and alternative communication um, in the classroom. I started out as a para-pro in an Easter Seals preschool program in the Philadelphia area. Um, the three classrooms that I were involved with all, were all mixed categorical preschool programs. I also at one time was assigned to a child who had an augmentative communication device. Um, we were all newbies getting started with those kinds of technologies, low-tech technologies and high-tech technologies. We were very fortunate in Pennsylvania in the early 80s to have grant programs where we had technology that kids could, um, we could write away for grants to get individual children their technology that they needed. And so we had a lot of technology through state grant programs that came into our classrooms as well as to individual kids. Um, and throughout the years as a special education teacher, I was in preschool programs. I was a transitional kindergarten teacher. I taught in resource classrooms at the elementary level, um, skipped over middle school and taught in high school resource. And then I worked at a statewide project for the Department of Education in Pennsylvania um, called the Pennsylvania Assistive Technology Center. Um, then it was known as Pentech. It's now PATAN, the Pennsylvania Assistive, Technology, Assistive Training and Technical Assistance Network. Um, and for the last 15 years, I've been an independent consultant. Um, and I travel around the country and um, in other countries doing training. Um, and consulting to schools and programs and universities on assistive technology. About um, two-thirds of my business really at this point is augmentative and alternative communication, implementation and assessment strategies, and the other third electronic reading and writing tools in the classroom. So it looks like we've got almost everybody dialed in here. I'll show you the results of what participants are here with us today. Um, typically in an AAC session, we have the majority of speech language pathologists, but also people that identify themselves primarily as an AT um, specialist in assistive technology or resource specialist. We also have family members. Welcome to people who are family members of individuals who use AAC. Um, I also fit into that category. Um, and I, um, we have OTs and PTs amongst us, um, special educators and people who are in that category of others. It's hard to get all of the things that we can be onto these lists. Our goal today is to look at those things that set the purpose for students who are in classrooms and in your home. Um, what are the things that create a need for them to communicate. And although you would like it to be that you put that iPad with an AAC app on it in front of them, or you put the Big Mac in front of them, or the Quick Talker, or whatever device it is that you put in front of them, that doesn't set their purpose to communicate with that device. 
the purpose is set by what they're doing, how the environment around them is arranged for their need to communicate or not to communicate, and then also you. What are your partner strategies like? And it's these three things that we have control over, we think, <laughs> um, we like to think, that we set the purpose for their need to communicate based upon what we're doing at this moment. What's the activity that's going on? How is the environment arranged around them um, for them to have to communicate? If everything is there for them and they can just get at everything and they don't need to request items or they don't need in a situation to remove themselves that people already do that for them, then there's no need for them to have to talk with their words or with their communication system's words. If you as a partner are always talking and always filling up the space, then they don't have any opportunity to communicate. If you don't have the expectation for them to communicate, then they don't see the purpose for themselves to be a communicator either. And when you learn strategies from sessions like today or all the other kinds of AAC workshops that you've gone to or other webinars that you've attended, and if you don't put those kinds of things into practice, then, you know, it doesn't become a reality. And so you have to go back and practice these things. And so the strategies that I'm bringing to you today are from a lot of practice. Um, these things come from what we call CEP, the Communication Enhancement Process. And when I say we, it's not just me. Um, it's practice that I've been working with. Um, a lot of really smart folks out of Oakland County Schools in Michigan. This is a county that's to the northwest of the Detroit area. It's 27 school districts that are in this county. We've been working on this project for six years, um, working with students who are communicating um, at the behavioral levels, at modes that are um, what some people will call pre-symbolic or um, non-intentional modes, and in the classroom, it's a lot of the classroom staff that are reading students' behaviors. Um, so for the last six years, we've been developing these strategies. I'm going to give you some background on that and what materials we're using, where you can get those same materials so you can replicate what it is that we're doing. And, of course, I'm going to be talking about the technology tools, moving kids from Big Macs and on to apps like Sounding Board. Um, and in this current school year, I've been using these same strategies in the SST Ohio regions um, you see here on the screen, and this is our first year in doing them with 13 teams in those regions. The kinds of things that we're doing in, in this communication enhancement process is this is not just a one-shot workshop. This is something that we're doing in a year-long intervention process in classrooms and all different kinds of schools um, and in all different kinds of classrooms in those schools. It might be classrooms that are in fully inclusive buildings. It might be in classrooms that are in self-contained rooms. It might be classrooms that are in um, special education school buildings. Um, it's in early childhood rooms. It's, I'm in classrooms in Michigan. Um, students, um, some students go to school to the age of 25. Um, they have then used some of their IDEA funds to, to fund ch students um, who are in that age group past 21. So we have some students that are post-school age that we're using these strategies with. We are focused on kids who communicate, again, with non-symbolic modes that we're trying to get them to be more intentional with um, communication and communication systems and using symbols to communicate. Um, we're trying to work with people in their communication, um, flow of their communication with people who are unfamiliar partners, so not just communicating with people who know their sounds or their sign language or all of their behaviors and what they might mean with their behaviors. So we're getting them to communicate with a wider range of partners. 
We're also trying to get their communication set up so that they can be free of a communication facilitator, so that they can communicate more independently, that they can go down to the school office and give information to the school secretary, free of having to go with an adult, you know, another person in the classroom, that they can go and give newspapers from classroom to classroom and give messages to other teachers. Um, and they can bring messages from other staff back to another classroom person. Um, we're also looking to increase the number of communication functions that our students who struggle with expressive communication aren't just looked at as requesters, that they don't just use communication systems during snack time, that they can use their communication systems to comment, that they can use their communication systems during science class, that they can use it during English literature classes, um, and that they can also use their communication systems during unprompted interactions when they're at lunchtime with their peers. And they could have been talking this last couple of weeks about what went on during the Olympics and what events they liked and what they thought about, you know, during the events that they liked and which one of the performances that they liked and which one of the things that they were so disappointed somebody didn't win the gold. We know about... What we know about these students is that they often communicate in unaided strategies. Some of their communications are by reflex, that they cry, that they use things that are socially unacceptable. You know, they might grab somebody and bring you to something that they want, that they also do things such as hit, spit, bite. And these are the kinds of things that we want to shape and mold and that we want them to be able to still be able to say, no, I don't like it. We want them to be able to say it in socially appropriate ways. We want them to be able to take these things that they might do that are repetitions of an action and use a symbol to be able to say, this is what I want, or this is what I like, or I want to share this with you. You know, I want to show you this movie that I like, rather than just, you know, what people think is flipping through an iPad screen and showing somebody a movie repeatedly, be able to tell somebody, I like this movie or I like this game on the web, to be able to use words through an icon to say that rather than just being able to look at as somebody that behaviorally, that's all they can do with an iPad is you know, I hear people will say that. Well, all they ever do on their iPad is go and keep showing people this same movie. Well, often they're doing that because they're trying to share that experience with you. Well, being able to say that with a symbol is, oh, I like this, and then going and showing that and linking to the movie is much more communicatively meaningful to people and can really share that through words rather than just by going to the movie. Often our students who use eye gaze use that by staring at things, looking at items, and only somebody that's really tuned in to them understands that they're using their eye gaze to communicate. And then when we give add symbols to it, it's the person on the exterior the symbols that we choose to put into a symbol display, then they're able to show by eye pointing to those symbols what it is that they're saying, what it is that they want to comment on, what it is that they want to ask to. But the eye gazer is, you know, stuck to what symbols we put in front of them. So then that becomes an aided strategy. We have kids who you know, communicate through head movements and body movements and their vocalizations. All of these are unaided strategies but become aided strategies when we add a symbol set to it so that they eye gaze to representations or they reach or they point to representations. We use partner-assisted strategies when we point for somebody who can't point of their own volition we point to things and then they use 
a sound or an eye blink to indicate, oh, that's the one I want when you are pointing to things. And then we get into technology-aided strategies where they will use a switch to interrupt the scanning display or they will use a switch to, you know, light a light when you might be doing partner-assisted scanning. Oh, that's the one I want. And then we get into the dedicated devices where, you know, a product that was created as an augmentative communication product to vocalize what it is that a child is saying. Or the non-dedicated devices or iPads or tablets that run software programs for AAC purposes or run apps that were created for AAC purposes. We call them non-dedicated because those computers and laptops and iPads and tablets can also do other things. When we're looking at this group um, that I want to focus on for these strategies, we're looking at kids that are communicating or can be communicating within this range of the kinds of communication things that are about refusing what it is that they don't like, obtaining that I want category, being social, and being able to give and get information. And what I'm going to talk about today are those things that are uh, one of the measures of those things, and there are lots of different assessment tools that people use. I'm just going to focus in on one tool um, from Charity Rowland and Philip Schwigert called the Communication Matrix. And some people have been introduced to this, and I'm often surprised what people that haven't been, but, you know, we'll introduce this to you today um, called the Communication Matrix. It's a free assessment tool um, available on the web, and the website is, um, is here that you can see. Um, it's something that's also available in paper, if that's something that you want. It's also downloadable. Um, the communication matrix chart, as you see here, is divided up into four groupings. Um, those messages that are about refusing um, are in the first group on the left. The next group are all the messages about obtaining. The next group um, is, are about social messages. And then the group on the right are the informational kinds of messages. And again, this is only a scale about birth to two expressively. It's not a receptive measure. Um, and it's about how um, students can also, um, also about how students communicate. Um, and top to bottom is about students and how they express their commun this communication. Um, and through their cries, through their unintentional, is those first two levels. It's a lot about how we read their communication. Um, and then if you think about these as levels, one and two are the unintentional, um, what some people might call pre-symbolic. They're not using symbols. They're using their cries. They're using their motions. Um, for people who are familiar with the assessment tool, of Every Move Counts. We do a lot in Every Move Counts with Jane Corson and Terry Foss um, and their assessment tool to be able to look and through observation of sensory items, how kids um, express their desire to continue interacting with something that might be shown to them visually or given to them auditorily or even tactually or olfactory, all of the senses, and get involved in assessments at that area. And you can break that down. And then how students respond to that, we build into what kinds of switches we might um, give them access to, and then build into that communication messages. Um, at level three in this scale, and that would be the third row that you're looking at. And I know that it's hard to read this, but if you go to the communication matrix, you'll see this broken down. I'm going to go and um, at a later point in here go and show this scale to you um, through a camera, but I don't want to jump out to that technology-wise too early uh, until I want to show you some things tech, um, on some other technology tools. Getting back to this idea of purpose, I want to talk a little bit more about the activities 
that we involve students in um, and how we get them involved in the classroom because this is not a pull-out strategy. Um, the things that I work on with classroom teams are in the classroom. Um, for the stu These students need to learn to communicate in the location in which they're going to be communicating. Um, rarely do our, our students learn to communicate and, or use a communication tool like a Big Mac in one location. Do they transfer it in what they learned in one location like a speech therapy room and then suddenly they'll learn to use it in the classroom um, by some osmosis. They need to learn to talk with the tools in the location that you want them to use those tools. So teach it right where you want them to use it. There are three different types of activities that we do in the communication enhancement process. Um, I talked to you just a little bit about Every Move Counts, and that's really where it's about preference assessments and I'll break that down for you a little bit more. Um, we also look at establishing intentional communication behaviors so that they are intentionally talking about the things that they want, um, getting your attention to them in socially appropriate ways, and then being able to expand behaviors and intents like I want, I want to do things more, I want more of something. So I'm going to break each of these down. One of the tools that um, you can use after this session to get more information on it are, is the book called First Things First from the um, Design to Learn folks. Um, I always like to give people another place to go to get some more information. And then I've even given you the um, page numbers that you can get um, more information on these different practices. And this is exactly what we do in our workshops and our year-long workshops. So for people that are doing preference assessments, um, one of the things that we look at is do you have a student that you know for sure what it is that they like and they don't like? And how do you set up activities for the kid that it's really easy to read, that you know for sure what it is that they don't like? Often we know this in some of our students before we know what it is that they like. They, you know what it is that they don't like. Um, they show that to you by throwing things away or pushing things away. And now you start to bring in the language behind that. Don't like that. I like that. And give them the symbols to go along with that, with their messages, and can put that on their devices and bring a picture to that, an image to that that you want them to do. Too often people give that on switches, and then they don't put any symbol on the switch. And so one of the rules that we always follow is, no naked switches that never give people just the blue switch or just the yellow switch or just the red switch, that you always put a symbol on it. And if you have a child who is blind or a child with some type of visual impairment, put a tactual with that switch. Or you give them an auditory preview with that switch so that they have some kind of symbol that you're starting to teach them. That's the beginning of teaching a child to be symbolic. For a child who is more difficult to read or a child who is very questionable that you're just not sure what it is that they like or they don't like, that's where we get very structured in our sensory probes on what it is that they like and don't like. And I really go to the practices of the Every Move Counts and get very structured with and it's not choice making. It, choice making is very different from a structured preference probe um, where you're introducing two items and looking to see what they turn towards or you're just introducing one item and seeing how they react to that one item. Um, this is more of a preference probe than it is a choice making activity. When we look at once you know what the items are that they like or don't like, 
and we're looking to see if they'll establish a requesting behavior towards it, that I want that item, or telling you that they don't want that item. Again, not choice making, but just delivering one item to them that they want it, or they want to have more of that. This could be something that you do in a sensory room, you know, where they want to keep rocking, and then you stop, and then you you know, see that they want to keep rocking and you say more or you want to do rocking or if you're doing something where um, they want to um, want to like a large ball and they want to keep bouncing on that ball or they're in the ball pit. We had a student that um, next to the ball pit was one of the um, um, items, sensory items, where their large flow of air came into it and it blew up the um, air mattress and that sensory of the feedback that the student got from the air mattress being blown up kind of made the ball pit move back and forth and he liked that feel of it and so that became the thing that he requested more of and so you'll never know what you'll find with some students that are operating on this sensory level that you can request you know, and request what we call reinstatement activities for and things that they'll like to do cause and effect wise. But it can also be a social activity. So something that, you know, when they come into school, being able to say hi to everybody and, you know, getting people to come towards them because they're saying, come over here and I want to say hi or even the hello and go away, come here and go away kinds of activities. And then we have activities that are, you know, I want to keep doing this or I want to stop. And these are things that you really have to give them control over. It has to be during the time of day that you're willing to be student-led, not teacher-led. That it's during your leisure time, it's during arrival at school, it's during things that can be very student choice time and honestly, is student choice time. A lot of people talk about how students um, are motivated by food, but I tell you, you can only do this with food if it can be truly a student choice. If you have a student that is failure to thrive, I warn you against doing this with food because it can be that... um, You know, if if you can't have a student be saying, I don't want that anymore because they're a failure to thrive student, then don't start with food. You know, then it's not about um, a student being, um, you know, freely in in control over stopping and choosing um, anymore. I'm going to pause here and take some questions. There is one question about somebody said about the communication matrix not being free any longer. Being able to do the electronic version of the communication matrix online is free. Being able to order the downloadable, I believe, is um, a $15 download um, cost. But the online version you can still do um, free online. And you can do that repeatedly as many times as you would like to. Um, What they do ask is if you're just playing around, you can do um, just you don't sign on and create a pretend student because they are um, collecting data on the student's um, they don't collect, they don't have the students names with, from which they're withdrawing the data from, but they are doing data collection on sets of students based on characteristic groups. So there is a way that you can go and do a pretend student and not have that put into the data set, but you, but, um, doing the communication matrix online is a free, but again, doing the, um, Downloading it is a cost to it. 
the authors of the first things first are are the folks that are partic- uh, that are a part of the design to learn group so that's charity Rollins and her um and the group of people that participate in design to learn there is a cost for them to the question is is the matrix cost to have them provide a report there is an option to do a customized report and you know what I'm not a part of the design to learn group. I don't make money from them. So, I, and I don't want to go more into what costs and what doesn't cost because that gets into kind of the financial end of that. Um, so you can go to design to learn and see what portions have a fee. The books to get them printed to you certainly have a cost to the books. Um, and to download, there is a cost to the download. I was, the free portion I was just talking about was to do the assessment. Online is free. So hopefully that answers those portions of those questions. Um, you have in um, your packet some examples of scripts of these activities and I, um, that our teams are doing. I'm going to be talking about a couple of those scripts but that's also about what session two is going to be getting on to. What I want to talk about next are the um, tools that we use in CEP activities. Um, and we use tools from all different companies. I want to talk a little bit about the progression strategy here um, in the tools um, within the AbleNet range of tools, this idea of starting out with a Big Mac and moving through to the different tools. Um, for me to get an idea of what tools you are using, I've got a little poll here for you. So just so I can get an idea of what, if you're using no-tech strategies, low-tech device, no-tech would be things that are paper-based. Low-tech would be um, things like Big Macs, the Twin Talker, um, dedicated high-tech devices, and if you're using apps. So let me get an idea here. We've got about 12 people that have responded. We've got 87 people on the web at this point, just so you know how many of your compatriots are online here. We've got about 50 people that have responded. About half of you are using web apps. Yeah, unfortunately, the way these are set up, I'm hoping that we can do this at another point that you can um, select more than one. And right now, choose, I guess I should tell you to choose the highest level at which you are using. All right, so it looks like we have almost everybody in. I'll give you about another five seconds to respond. We've got 67 people that have responded out of the 87. All right, I'm going to skip to our results so you can see that we've got a lot about over half of people are using apps at this point, but we've got a good group of people that, you know, a large number of people if we split everybody up. And my assumption is going to be that people that are using apps also have, are using, many people also are using the other um, kinds of strategies as well. Um, if I go back to this slide of the different tools, I'm going to do, and we're going to, all, I would need everybody out there to keep your fingers crossed because we're going to go out and I'm going to share my desktop. And I'm going to, whoa, not that program. This is what happens. We're going to share my desktop. 
And we're going to get out and see some of the devices. And I want to show you this idea of the progression strategy. A lot of times, we start with the Big Mac. And people might have a message like a hello. Hello, I'm here. And so we'll have a greeting that a student will say, hello, I'm here. And, you know, that's a place that will often start in an arrival routine. And then, um, progression-wise, we might have an arrival routine that moves the students through a couple of steps. And so from that Big Mac of just, hello, I'm here, because they could keep saying, hello, I'm here. Hello, I'm here. Hello, I'm here. Hello, I'm here. And you'll find that students often will have, you know, will have the student that, you know, is the constant, what we might call a Big Mac slapper. And they say that, and intentionally, they're hitting it repeatedly because they want to get, you know, a lot of attention. And it might be that that's the only time they get to use their Big Mac, is that they get to say, hello, I'm here, hello, I'm here, hello, I'm here, hello, I'm here, to many different people. And then what happens is that people will take that away from them because they hit it too many times. And what happens then is that if you are the external control of that Big Mac, and you keep taking it away from the student, they only learn that I don't get to talk because somebody takes it away. And then every time you give it back to them, they slap it as many times as they can because the only time they get a voice is when you give it to them. So you need to keep the products with them so they start to learn self-control. The next step up is by doing something like with the step-by-steps, you know, whether you've got a little step-by-step -step or a big step-by-step, -step, but we also use sequencers from Attainment and the Chickadee from Satillo and the other companies like the Smooth Talker. I feel like I have to name them all. Um, but here, like with the step-by-step, -step, I have the Hello, I'm Here. Hello, I'm here. But that then it follows with, can you help me take my coat off? And then somebody takes the child's coat off. What did my mom write in my notebook? So what did my mom write in my notebook? And then somebody gets their notebook out of their backpack and reads to them what is in the notebook. And now they can say, I'm ready for school to start. So I'm ready to school to start. So I've got these four messages. And... Might, they might bang out those messages right away, and then they, now they have to start to learn. Oh, I say, hello, I'm here. Somebody greets me back. You know, now the next thing is I've got to ask somebody to take my coat off. Somebody takes my coat off. Then I'm going to say, get my notebook. What did my mom write? Somebody gets my notebook. And we start to practice that reciprocal. So I say something, somebody does something. Say something, somebody does something to me. I say something, somebody, something else happens. And we learn and we practice that every day. It's my arrival routine. I practice that with the same person. I start to practice that with different people. And this gets done every day. I can't emphasize to you how much the everyday thing is important, that it's not a performance, it's not just a one-day occurrence. If Miss Betty is with me today, but it's with my teacher, it's with every para pro, it's with the substitute para pro, that everybody knows that this is my routine, that as soon as I come in from the bus, my arrival routine gets practiced. And I, until the student starts to learn, I say this once, somebody says something back, then I come back and I say the next thing until somebody takes my coat off, then I say the next thing until the note gets read, then I say the next thing, and then thumbs up, we're all ready for school to go on. And so these kinds of things happen, and I might have a routine 
for every period of the day. And then once I'm familiar with this routine and I've learned the back and forth nature of communication, that I've learned that there's a sequence to this, and I'm guaranteed that I'm going to say these things every day. Now I don't have to be challenged with what symbol went with each message. I know the message. I know the routine. Now I can start to learn which of these symbols went with the message. So something like the Quick Talker 7, now I have four locations for those four messages. Now I can say these same four me- Oh, do I not have it turned on? I can say these four messages in the same sequence, in the same activity. See, too often we challenge students by swapping out people, swapping out activities, teaching them new devices, teaching them new symbols, and doing too many new things at the same time where what we need to do is keep the variables low. We need to keep the situation the same. We need to keep the people the same. And then what we need to do is just move them up to the devices through a sequence. And so the activity is a known activity. The messages are known messages. The sequence of when I say things is a known thing. So now I have those same four messages, the same thing that they heard in the step-by-step, but now I put them onto the quick talker or whatever device. You know, I have kids doing the same strategy on the Go Talks. I have them doing the same strategy on the Tech Talks and the Tech Speaks. You know, it doesn't matter the product line. I just happen to be showing them to you on the, on the um, AbleNet devices today. Some kids were moving them into these devices through um, coming from picture exchange. This problem that happens with picture exchange, and I, one of the things that I think happens, this is, you know, the world according to Kelly, is that we move them from this mobility strategy of moving symbols off of a paper device and on to a sentence strip, and then we teach them to press, and it's a totally different motor strategy. So now instead of doing a motor strategy, what we'll do on the quick talkers is we'll put their sentence strip right on the bottom of the quick talker, and we'll put a second set of symbols on top of their quick talker symbols. So what I've done is just printed out a second overlay for their quick talker, and we've put those second symbols on the top of the quick talker symbols. So now when they say their messages on the quick talker, as they're pulling their messages off, the device talks, and they move it to their sentence strip so they can then pass their sentence strip to the person that they're talking to, and all of that happens on the quick talker. So then, you know, moving from the quick talker, or if you're not even doing that on the quick talker, we can do this same thing on sounding board. So I'm going to move to sounding board. I can do this just as arrival. And they can be doing this on arrival. Hello, I'm here. So, hello, I'm here. You know, they could have done this as individual messages. Help me with my coat. They could have, they could have had a note message. What did my mom write in my notebook? Or... I'm ready to start my day. Or I could put this all together as a routine. Hello, I'm here. Can you help me put my coat on? What did my mom write in my notebook? I'm ready to start my day. 
So we can set it up in sounding board that way, that it goes from one message to another. They're only seeing what they need. And then, just as I showed you in the progression from dedicated device to dedicated device, here in sounding board, I can make it as four symbols on a sounding board, or we could have done it as two symbols that moved on to two other symbols. Hello, I'm here. Can you help me take my coat off? What my mom write in my notebook? I'm ready to start my day. So whether you're just starting in sounding board, you know, and doing it with the one by one by one, you know, or two by two, it, you know, it's about thinking through what it is that you're doing and not, you know, harshly moving a child from, you know, from this, you know, this one message and then suddenly thinking that they're going to be able to do four. And then what often happens is that teams blame it on the student, you know, that they couldn't do it, that the child couldn't do it, that they weren't ready for it, that it was too much for them, you know, all of these things that we often do to students and say about students. So that's the idea of the progression strategy, you know, moving up step by step within the same activity with a message that builds one message after another. You know, again, back to that purpose, that the activity is what you build and purpose to communicate within. You use all these environmental strategies that you've learned in other workshops. You know, materials that you, that are motivating to students, that you have things in view but they're out of reach, you know, that they have to request things for, things that they need assistance with, you know, the ideal, you know, that there are small amounts that they have to re keep requesting portions of. You know, if you're in your snack routines, you don't give them a handful of crackers. You know, you just give them a couple carrot sticks. You don't give them a whole pile of carrot sticks because then they can't, they don't have anything to ask for more of. You know, involve peer partners. I can't, you know, emphasize that enough. When we've had our activities in the CEP program where there have been peers around, our students learn to communicate in much more rich situations that way than when it's just an adult and, a, and themselves and a student. Partner strategies. You know, I'm going to say this. It's going to sound harsh. Shut up. We talk too much. You know, and we say, oh, it's a language-rich environment. But if all you're doing is talking, your kids never have any airspace. Um, you have to avoid an excessive use of, what do you want, what do you want, what do you want, what do you want? You have to say it once and give yourself some pause time for your student to think about what it is that they need. You have to make communication tools available where they are and when they need to communicate. Um, we don't always need to use prompting, but when you're going to prompt, know when and why you're doing it. There are prompting strategies that are most to least and least to most. We use our most to least prompting strategies when you're teaching a brand new skill. If a child has never used a display on an iPad before or they've yet, never used a Big Mac before or they've never used any product before, then you might use your full physical support and then fade. But if they've used one of these things before, you really should be using a least to most prompting strategy. These are the things that are better for skill mastery to independence because you're not um, you're less likely to have prompt dependency when you use a least to most prompting strategy because your first thing is to pause, to have a natural cue. You know, you have the natural situation that a child wants more of something because you've stopped, that they've run out of something. That's a natural cue. 
And then you have to decide, is this a child that I can use a verbal cue with, or is this a child that's just going to repeat? Then I might have a gesture cue that gestures towards the communication system. It doesn't point exactly to what they're supposed to do. And then you might model. And then all between all of these steps, you are pausing. And you have to decide how long your pause is for a student. Is it five seconds? Is it ten seconds? If I pause for 75 seconds, are they going to be asleep or are they going to be naked and out the door? But, you know, you have to be long enough and expected enough that they know that something is supposed to happen on their end. And then you might want to do a partial. You might just want to touch their hand or you might want to just bump their elbow towards it. Then, if they don't communicate with their system, then you do a full model for them. Now, we're getting here towards the end, and we have to pull this all together. And you want to make sure that any feedback that you give them isn't feedback that is about good talking, good using your switch. Don't say any of that stuff. That stuff is like throwing a party. You, you can't throw a party just because somebody activated a switch because kids then learn to wait for that, and they're only performing for you. You want them to be excited that they communicated because you gave them what it is that they asked for, that you commented back to them, that you answered their question. Those are the things that you need to be looking for when you're doing these kinds of communication situations. So again, pulling this together, we're going to use this idea of scripting, and I'm going to build more on this in session two, but I wanted to give you some examples here. I didn't want to leave you hanging with this implementation strategy. The idea of scripting has been written about in different books from Janice Light. It's been written about and, and looked at in different um, research articles. Um, I'm giving you copies in the handouts for today um, and a blank copy of a communication script. Um, we look at scripts as a way basically to get the, all the adults on the same page. Um, and you have examples of different scripts. Um, and the idea is not to be on the script forever, but it's a place to start so that people know what the cues are ahead of time and what the prompts are for when the student doesn't say and do what they're supposed to say and do, that you know what the next steps are in that prompting hierarchy um, to do and to say. It gives you a teaching routine to follow. Um, so I'm going to go to a bigger copy of this. So what you'll find in the scripts are the purpose. You'll see criteria that teams were looking for. Um, you'll see what the environmental setup is, where the switches or where the communication device or the iPad with the app are. You'll see where the position of the student and the partner are, any of the setup. Um, verbal things that they say ahead of time or any physical supports that they're doing ahead of time will be in the first, second, and third columns. What the student is doing and what was programmed into the device will be in the what and the how of what the student is saying. And if they don't do and say what's expected, you will see in the last columns. So, and if they don't say what they're supposed to say, and I always use words like the student is saying, even though it's coming out of a communication system, what they're saying, then what does the staff do? And that would be what verbal prompt do they say, or what gesture do they make, or what physical cue do they give, what physical model do they do? What, you know, do they then do as a partial prompt? What then do they do as a full prompt? So these are the things that you're going to find in the copies of the scripts. And what I encourage you to do is either try and implement one of these scripts with your students 
or create one for yourself, um, you're more than welcome to send a copy of that to me, and I can give you some feedback on that between now and our next um, our next webinar. But we also will be working on these in the next webinar and setting them up for data collection because the script itself does become the thing that we collect data on. Um, before we end, just so I have an idea of who's going to be joining us in the future sessions, um, we're going to be doing more on implementing these kinds of progression strategies um, through the implementation and data collection portion of our um, session in session two, and then analyzing this data on session three. It always amazes me how quickly this hour goes. As I said, we've been doing these um, communication and enhancement process. We've been doing this for six years in Oakland County, in the school districts in Oakland County, Michigan. Um, and then this year we've been doing this in Ohio in four of the SST regions. Uh, we've been doing that with 13 school systems there, which is really exciting that we've been able to expand. We've got 99 people here on the web that have joined us. Thanks to everybody that has uh, was brave enough to join us again this time. Um, the, one of the questions that's come on board here is how do we utilize these strategies with significantly physically involved children? Oh, my goodness, we have a load of kids that have multiple disabilities. We have kids that have been involved um, with not just physical strategies, but also kids that um, have, who are blind and have, um, who are deaf blind. Um, we use all different kinds of switches with kids, so kids that aren't just using their hands on switches, but kids that use switches um, with a variety of non-mechanical switches. We also are using them with, with um, low-tech strategies and no-tech strategies, so with kids that aren't even using um, physically accessible switches. I'm going to skip to the results here so that you can see. Um, how many people are going to be joining us um, of the 67 people that have responded. Also, we wanted to give you some idea if you're searching for AAC products where people can go for that information. And then here in closing, I just want to thank everybody. Um, you can email me um, your ideas or any follow-up information at kellyfoner at gmail.com. You can also go to my website to get to my email as well. Um, I'm going to give information here to Benjamin so he can close us out. And I just want to thank you so much um, for attending today.